Well, we finally get to the movies I consider good. And up first is my second favorite show movie, Super 1 the Movie. What makes this movie stand out from all the other Showa movies is that it's fun. Yeah, sure, you could apply that to the other Showa films, but I'd say that Super 1 the movie is one of the only Showa films that manages to balance telling a good story with a fun element. The main plot is really simplistic, with Kazu trying to stop Dogma from obtaining the weapon known as the Soaring Firing Machine, which is literally just a giant dragon flying ship. Now, like I hinted earlier, even though it's simplistic, this film still has depth to its narrative. Sure, it's not jaw-dropping quality with big defining moments for these characters, but it is better than what we got before. I like the movie's exclusive side characters because they actually felt like real important characters instead of faceless no-names that the film forces us to care about. We got to know their backstories and motivations. Even Super 1's main side cast got focused in this film. Sure, it's not much, but they actually felt useful. Plus, the fights never felt like they were dragged on or just there for the sake of having a fight. Each fight felt like it had a purpose behind it with a meaningful conclusion at the end of each one. However, even though this movie's a fun ride in my eyes, there are three detriments I have. One is that it doesn't really enhance the experience of Super 1. We don't learn about any of the characters we love or get to see them challenged in any meaningful way. But this is still an issue that doesn't really cause this movie's ratings to go down that much. The second is that there is a small story issue that sort of does make the actions of the characters questionable, but that's not really the biggest issue. The third and biggest issue I have is inserting the rest of the show writers in at the very end of this film. Why did they even need to be in this film? This was perfectly fine as just a solo film for Super 1. At least they don't take up too much screen time, unlike in 8 Riders vs Galaxy King. So yeah, even though it's not the best story in the world nor features the most emotional moments in Rider, Super 1 the movie is still a really fun film with a lot of good fight scenes and characters you can get invested in. Honestly, it's probably one of the most underrated films in my eyes. Well, we go from a film where I talk about everything they did good to a film where I can only talk about what they did wrong. Yeah, I can really only rank Freewa the first generation not for what it did good, but what for it did bad. The plot and pacing were great, but I just feel like this film was just pointless. None of the characters really got any meaningful expansion to them. Even though the Geocast is in this film, they basically do nothing, so it's really just a film focused on Arto, and they really didn't do much with him. Like seriously, by the end of this film, what changes with him? His dream of creating a world with humans and human gears is bolstered? He doesn't hate his father as much? We already know these things, so why bother having a film that tries to tell the audience these things? Like I stated before, the rest of the Zero One cast and Geocast really do nothing, which just sucks in my opinion. Sogo is just there to be a reason why there's time travel in this film, and also be a quote unquote mentor to Aruto, which only occurs once in the entire film. Izu is just there to reinforce the whole Power of Dreams message this film contains, and then the rest are just there for padding and cameos. I don't care about them in this film at all. Now we get to the more controversial points I have about this film. First up, as expected, are the villains. Finnis is so bad as a villain. They want to rewrite history so Kamen Riders rule over the world because, hey guys, did you know that Kamen Riders were intended to be used as forces of evil? So that's why I have my plan because it's symbolism. Uh, alright, doesn't explain anything else though. Plus it doesn't help that they have no personality, no backstory, and how they got the power of Ichigo from Geo makes no sense. At least Will was slightly better, but not by much. Honestly, he could have been one of the better movie villains, but no, they squandered that chance. At first, he wants to have human gears rebel against humans because he believes that Koronosuke and the others are just treating the human gears as slaves. This would have been a really interesting motivation, as it would raise the question of are human gears just designed to benefit humans, but they didn't keep that motivation for him. Instead, he just reveals he wants to take over the world because grr, humans bad, human gear better, grr. What a wasted opportunity. Finally, and probably the most controversial point, Sorio. Yeah, I didn't like him. Well, I liked him in the beginning, but my love for him decreased as the film went on, especially at the very end. Sure, we learned that he created a bunch of the drivers, but the dude just felt like a dick. He acts oddly antagonistic for no reason, even making Aruto believe that he wants to destroy humans as it's the only way for human gears to smile, but it actually turns out that he wants to protect both human gears and humans to create a world where they can all smile together. Okay, why didn't you tell Aruto this as soon as possible, and instead wait until he firmly believed that you were going to kill all of humanity? And to make matters worse, he then tells Aruto to kill him because you won't be a real president until you do so. I'm like, what? Why? There is no reason for Sora to do this. Oh, this is for the best. Oh, I wanted you to become your own president, not just living in the shadows of your predecessors. That doesn't even make sense. 
Yeah, I'm sure Aruto really wanted the mental trauma of ending his own father's wife, who was clearly saying to instead work with Aruto to take down the villains. I'm sure that was for the best. Also, what do you mean by becoming your own president? Aruto has never felt like he was just living in the shadows of his predecessor in this film, so why bother teaching him to grow out of that issue? And finally, why are you trying to teach Aruto that you need the strength to carry your dreams out alone? When the main point of Zero One is that you can't achieve your dreams alone, but rather through the connections and bonds you made with others. This literally goes against Zero One's own theme. There are other story issues, but really that's everything I wanted to talk about to convey my feelings. Even though I've given this movie some shit, I still think this is a good movie, with good developments, character moments, and decent villains. Now we're out of the range of the 6 out of 10 movies, so up next is the first 7 out of 10 film. Fitting enough is the first film of the XA trilogy, it's Brave and Snipe. Let me say this, it's really only ruined by the subplot of Nico and Luke, but I'll talk about that a bit later. Now, the plot and pacing are fine, with no major plot holes that ruin anything, though what brings it up is also the same thing that brings it down, the handling of the characters. Now, let me say that what I'm about to talk about may seem like a stretch, but it still makes sense to me. Hero's my favorite character from the film, mainly because he finally gets a sense of closure. Sure, he already got his closure in the TV series, but I feel like it's different here. And here comes the stretch part. While the TV season did see Hero move on from his past, that was more him prioritizing the present rather than the past. He was finally able to start trusting and prioritizing the people he has, instead of the people that are no longer with him. However, while he may have chosen to live in the present, it is only in this film that he can truly start living without regrets and guilt over his mistakes. With Taiga, while he doesn't get as nearly as much expansion as Hero in this film, mainly just showcasing how he wants to make amends with Hero, I still liked his handling. I like seeing how both of them were fellow soldiers tied by the same tragedy, and how both of them are trying to rectify the same issue so the other one doesn't have to. Hell, I even like Saki in this film. Sure, she doesn't really have a purpose other than to move the plot along, but I really loved how this film fleshed out the relationship between her and Hiro. It's really something that the main series neglected to do, as it's implied in the film that Saki was really the only person that Hiro connected with during his studies in college, which explains why Saki's death affected Hiro so heavily. Now with the other characters, they're a bit more hit and miss. Ren was pointless, and he really didn't do much, but I'm at least glad they brought back an already established villain rather than creating a new one for this film alone. Luke and Nico, though, they're complete garbage. First off, Luke. He's just a creep. He just comes off as a really desperate dude that wants to date Nico for some dumb reason. Not help that he basically forces Nico to backtrack in her development. At the end of X8, Nico was an adult who wanted to help others by being a doctor, but now she suddenly decides that she wants to play games instead because Luke showed me my true self. Like, what? I get they were trying to have Nico develop so that she could figure out what she really wants to do in life, but did it really have to be at the expense of her development and relationship with Taika? Overall, this was a good movie. Hero still remains my favorite character and I like the quote he gets, even if it was a bit unnecessary, but hey. Taika was alright, though I did find his character arc to be once again treading on old grounds. However, everyone else was decent or just terrible. Well, we go from a movie that I like for its characters to a movie that I like for its story. Yeah, Wizard and Magic Land is basically just like a better episode of Wizard. The movie doesn't really matter in the grand narrative of Wizard, but it still just tells a good story. I liked how this film basically spent the first half introducing us to the world where everyone knows magic, before transitioning into the latter half where we start getting into the whole Monster of the Week plot. This film never really felt like it dragged on or rushed anything. Now, the characters were honestly just kinda fine? Haruto just acts like he always does, which is good because I find him entertaining. Koyomi had an arc in this film, but it was mainly just warning that she'll be fine as long as Haruto's with her, which is decent, I guess. With the other characters, Emperor Mai was an okay character. I liked how he hated everyone because they shunned him for not being able to use magic, but I didn't really like how his arc ended. Instead of warning that wanting to kill all mages because they mocked him is wrong on his own, the film just flat out forced him to realize it. It isn't character development if you are forced to change out of your own free will. Sheena is a young boy, and that's all I'm going to say about him. He's honestly completely pointless to the entire plot, really only there to push the message of, your friends will help you through everything, which then got changed to trust who you believe in and don't regret it. Finally, we get to the villain, Orma. And he's kinda generic. He wants to rule over the world because he's a phantom, I guess. I mean, he's basically just a regular phantom that took his plan to 11. So yeah, that's really all I can say. The best thing about this film was how the film dealt with a new world where everyone can use magic. Everything else was just kinda okay or decent.
This film wasn't average, but it wasn't completely amazing. Somewhere in between. Well, at this spot, we get to my favorite show film, and through the process of elimination, you already know what it is. Yeah, Kamen Rider J is, in my opinion, the most underrated film in the entire franchise. People keep talking about Zeto, but like, what about J? It's like a hundred times better than that. The action is just as good, the characters are so much more interesting, the villains are just as cool as Doras, the music is also amazing, like, how do people not talk about this movie more? Anyway, as you can tell, I think that the characters are so, so much better than Zeto and Shin's cast. Even within 44 minutes, Koji is a more fleshed out character than both Masaru and Shin. He's a photographer that cares for nature, with a nice big brother vibe to him, but he can be a bit reckless at times. Compare that to Masaru Shin, where the only thing they got was being a lab rat to the professor they respected. With the other characters, there were really only two of them, Barry and Kana. However, thankfully, neither of them really appeared much, so time wasn't really wasted on them. Finally, the villains. Good lord, they are really good. Unlike the neo-organism who wanted to kill humans because god complex, the fog wanted to devour humans so that they could provide food for their race. Sure, it's a simple motivation for evil, but it goes a long way making these villains have depth and making them understandable. And with the story, similar to Super 1 the movie, it's just a fun ride all around. The plot moves at a decent pace with no big story issues, everything is explained so that the viewer knows what's going on from the start, looking at you Zeto, and the fights and set design are simply amazing. Sure, I could say that the villains could have been more memorable, the story could have been more complex, and Koji could have had more stuff to him to flesh in Mao's character, but for a film that's only 44 minutes long, I'd say what we got was pretty great. So overall, I think Jay is a great film that manages to balance action, plot, and character extremely well, especially for a Showa film. Can you tell that I'm a big Jay defender? This film is probably one of the biggest comebacks that a series has ever had. Yeah, Gay's majesty is simply great. I know, I was completely shocked too. Heisei Generations Forever and Over Quarters were such bad movies that I didn't think that Geo could get better. And then came Gaze Majesty and oh man, it blew all expectations out of the water. Now, Gaze was simply a great character in this film, except there's a caveat, that being that the film technically doesn't focus on Gaze, but rather Geitsu. To briefly explain, he is not the same Gaze as the one from the TV series, but the alternate universe version who was created after Soga reset of the timeline at the end of Geo. While this does disappoint me, it doesn't disappoint me that much. And yes, I know he regains his memories, but by that time, the film is almost over. Anyway, I love Gaze's development in this film, going from someone who's lost his dream to figuring out what he wants to do in life. Funny how in 30 minutes, Gaze has developed more as a character than in 49-25 minute episodes. With that aside, there's really not much else I can say about Gaze other than his development's great, so let's move on to the other characters. They're all fine. The Legend Riders and the rest of the Geo crew were nice to see, but it's very clear that they didn't really contribute to the plot at all. Speaking of the plot, it was… decent? The ending felt rushed, but I like the overall story. Sure, there are some plot holes, such as how the Legend Riders are in Geo's world when the ending literally separated each season into its own world, but hey, pretty much every season afterwards has disregarded Geo's finale, so why not? Also, Oma Geo somehow exists even though he shouldn't exist, so… Though what brings it down is probably obvious since I haven't talked about them yet. The villain, White Waz from another world. Yeah, he's quite bad. He wants to become a savior by absorbing Gaze's power because, I don't know, thematics? Also, he survived because he managed to escape the destruction of his another world. Okay, how? So yeah, another film that I can't really say much about other than it's great. I love Gaze's development and the interactions between the characters, but it's brought down by White Walls, Gaze being developed and not Gaze, and some off-story beats. Well, once again, we got a movie that does wonders expanding a character, despite my initial prejudice towards it. Yeah, All Writers vs. Die Shocker was a lot better than I was expecting. I mean, it had elements of things I've hated in worse films. Riders fighting between each other, Shocker coming back, and introducing random characters out of left field. But this movie somehow made it work. Well, it's the only movie that made it work, and even then, it's still not that amazing. Anyways, like I hinted in the introduction, this movie really helped to define Tsukasa as a character. I mean, he was always someone with swagger and personality, but he feels more complete. Sure, his goal of finding his own world hasn't changed, but now it's gained more meaning, since he's not searching for his own world, but a world that he can call his home. He also gets a lot of his backstory revealed in this film. He was actually the leader of Die Shocker, joining it because he believed that killing all the writers would stop the destruction of all the worlds. 
He also probably reaches his lowest in his life. After the revelations about his past and his selfish actions jeopardizing his own friend's safety, he's abandoned by everyone and left with nothing. But after a pep talk, he realizes that he needs to atone for his sins by fighting against Die Shocker and to protect the people he still cares about, even if they don't care about him. Honestly, this film really made me love Tsukasa even more. The other characters, however, well, they don't get as much focus as Tsukasa did. Honestly, they performed their roles well, adding to the drama and story when necessary, but they didn't really do much other than that, which is a shame since I would've loved to see more. Saya was the movie exclusive character, and she's revealed to be Tsukasa's sister, who has always had a grudge against Tsukasa for basically abandoning her because he wanted to go on journeys. Though, she eventually makes up with Tsukasa, while also learning that she needs to be able to stand on her own without constantly being babied. Yeah, her arc was good, but I ultimately found she was pointless in the end. I honestly would've liked her to be removed so that we could have more time focusing on Tsukasa being a part of Daishaka or his redemption. The plot, like I hinted, was pretty good. The writer tournament actually had a purpose in the grand narrative, and I liked the reason for why everyone joined. So they could determine the strongest writer to stop the worlds from all being destroyed. And even though I would've preferred Sayo be removed from the film, I liked how she at least impacted Tsukasa. Sure, there are some story hiccups, such as how Tsukasa joined Daishaka in the first place never being explained, but for an anniversary film... I might as well give it some swag because anniversary films too tend to have more story issues. And villains, yeah, I still don't like them. Honestly, whenever Shocker comes back for a film, just assume they're one of the worst parts of the film. They want to take over all the worlds because they're evil. They do also have a commander in the form of Nobuhiko, who's the butler of Tsukasa and Sayo, and he's Shadow Moon. Yeah, this dude is just here for fan service and nothing else. Despite that, this film was great. Tsukasa had a really good expansion to his character in this film, and honestly, I think he was at his best in this film. Everyone else was either useless or were good, but felt unnecessary in the grand scheme of things, and as expected, the villains were terrible. Though the story was fine, with nothing really feeling like it was pointless. Well, we're reaching the top 10, and fitting enough, we now have the films I would rate an 8 out of 10. Starting off this last 10 is Paradox with Poppy. This is basically Brave and Snipe without any of the dumb Wook and Nico quality subplot included. Parado got as good of an expansion as Hero did in the first film, basically learning the importance of heart. Sure, by the end of the series, Parado understood the value of lives, but not the value of heart. With Poppy though, she wasn't good, but not bad either. She was really just there to give backstory in Masamune and reaffirm the belief that boxers and humans can coexist. However, she's still a fine character in this film. Plus, the film actually does stand out from the rest, because it actually has a good villain. Black Parado is the buckster of Masamune, and he's basically just Parado from the very start of the series, but more cold. Sure, he is kind of bland, not really having much of a personality other than Ruthless, but I think it works to serve the story. Parado is essentially fighting his own past self in this film, one that doesn't care for humans and only cares about his own victory. Yet Parado manages the best Black Parado, and by extension his own past self, showing how strong his development has made him. We also have Saiko. Sure, she was in Brave and Snipe, but she didn't really stand out until this film, where we learn a lot about her. It turns out that she's the daughter of Michiko Saizen, the villain from Heisei Generations, and she wants to kill all Bucksters because she wants revenge for them killing her father. Sure, it's a simple motivation, but like I said for the fog, it goes a long way to make her a great villain. And the story is quite great. Sure, the beginning of the film can feel like it's just there for padding, but honestly, I felt it set the tone of the film pretty well. Overall, a great film that has good villains that serve the story, great developments for the focus characters, and had a great story that wasn't bogged down by any stupid subplots that caused characters to reverse in their developments. Up next, we got another film that I feel is quite a bit underrated. While the common consensus is that Movie War Full Throttle is good, I feel like most people don't really talk about this film when discussing the best Movie War films. Well, I'm here to try and change that by saying that Full Throttle is not only one of the best Movie War films, but also one of the best films in general. Between the two portions, I'd say that Gimes is definitely the weaker one. They basically repeated Mitsuzane's redemption arc from the finale, and also didn't really focus on Takatora at all in this film. However, I will acknowledge that they at least try to develop these characters a bit more, and I do understand wanting to focus on Mitsuzane since his redemption was a bit rushed. There were also some things that weren't as strong as they could have been, namely some weird story points, such as Ryuma deciding to be a part of Mega Hacks when the dude has never bowed down to those stronger than him, Mitsuzane having another Sengoku driver for no reason, and Kota getting revived because Kiwami bullshit. The second part is Mega Hex who is some alien robot that wants to synthesize everything into one being because harmony and being a part of the system is good. While he wasn't bad, he was certainly wind. However, he does make up for it with his philosophy going against the characters of this film. Now onto the better part, the challenge from Lupin. What makes it better is the development that Chinosuke gets over the course of this portion. 
After losing Krim, he starts feeling lost, believing he can't do anything on his own. However, thanks to the shift cars, he finds out that he doesn't need to have Krim nor the ability to transform to be amazing on his own, which is an element that wouldn't really get touched again until the finale. Now, the other characters don't really do much, but they do always serve the story in a decent way, so I won't talk about them and instead just move on to the villain of this part, Lupin otherwise known as Zoroku. Zoroku is interesting to say the least. It turns out he's actually the cyborg known as ZZZ, which was intended to be Krim's original body, but since Krim didn't have the fortitude to fuse with it, he decided to hide it away and become the drive driver instead. Anyways, Zoroku managed to find it and fuse with it. Now his backstory is fine and all, but it's his motivation for being a villain that makes him weird. He ultimately wants to replace Shinosuke as a true hero because he's angry that Shinosuke is just a naive greenhorn and Krim has been turned into a stab belt? What? Okay, but how does this explain you trying to steal things in a grandiose way? Zoroku isn't bad, but funny enough, I think he's a worse villain compared to the literal robot that has no personality. And finally, we have the team-up portion between the two writers, and honestly, it's probably the greatest final section of a movie war film. Shinosuke and Kota play off of each other really well, and seeing them interact was great. I honestly wish this section was longer, or other movie war sections managed to have the same quality as this one, since I really loved it. Overall, this was a great film. Sure, it didn't really do much for the Gaim cast, had meter villains, and some plot holes here and there, but I still liked it. Plus, Drive's portion really made up for the lackluster Gaim portion, though it's because of those reasons that it's not getting any higher. Well, we got another winter film, and it's one you'd probably expect to rank this high. Yeah, Hasty Generations Final is a much, much better film than its predecessor. There's really only one thing about this film that I really dislike. That is the villain, Kaize Mogami. Sure, his gimmick was interesting. There are essentially two alternate versions of him, one from Build's world and one from X-Aid's world. x Mogami is honestly pointless. We barely knew anything about the Dune and it felt like he was only there because we gotta have some things to connect with two worlds colliding. At least Build Mogami was more interesting, but he was also just bland and cliched. At first, he was a researcher that discovered the existence of parallel worlds, attempting to get to those other worlds, but the Toto government wouldn't fund him, so he left to join Namba and created the Kaiser system. His ultimate goal is to become immortal and rule over every parallel world because he's insane, I guess. To do this, he must fuse both Builds and x world alongside his alternate self to become Bai Kaiser. Okay, but how does this grant you immortality? The other elements though, while I liked them, they weren't really the best it could have been. The story was fine, though there were some issues I had with them. Emu and Sento really didn't do much at all in the film, and while seeing the Legend Riders all return again was amazing, I will admit I did think there could have been more to them than what we saw. So, if I'm saying most of everything was average, why does this film rank so high? Well, it's mainly because of Ryuga. His development over the course of this film was quite frankly, great. Through the efforts and advice of the other Legend Riders, he warns what it means to be a common writer, to fight for everyone no matter what. There is only one, tiny issue that I have with it though. Shouldn't he already know that he wants to fight for everyone since, well, when he first transformed into Karasi, he stated that he would listen to Kasumi's wishes to fight for others. But I'm nitpicking here. I really do love how the Legend Riders played a role in Ryuka's development, making them actually feel meaningful to the story. It's why I find this a much, much better film than Hasty Generations. We only have to deal with one, technically two, villains, there are no random movie exclusive characters that we have to care about for this film only, and the Legend Riders actually pass down advice to the newer writers in this film. Overall, this film is great. It adds some great development for Ryuga, stellar moments from the rest of the cast, and a fun and intriguing plot, though there are still some hiccups along the way. We're entering the last 7 now, and it's time for the films that are rated 9 out of 10. First up is Drive Summer Film, Surprise Future. Now, this film was excellent, really only brought down by a few minute nitpicks I have in this film, and you can probably guess one of them. Yeah, it's the villain, the Paradox Roid Mute. While he does have an interesting backstory, namely impersonating Shinosuke's future son, Eiji, and coming back in time, honestly, his entire character was pretty bland. He just wants to take over the world because he's evil. The other nitpick I have is something that probably sounds really petty, but Shinosuke didn't really develop as much as I'd hope. Yes, he lost Krim again in this film, but really, how does losing Krim affect him in this film? He goes through some turmoil and grief, but does he change or grow by the end of this film? Not really. That's not to say I didn't like seeing the struggles of Shinosuke in this film. In my opinion, Drive is probably the best series in terms of drama, and Surprise Future really goes hard with it here. The moment when Shinosuke visits Krim's original Drive Pit in that entire sequence, god it's so good. 
Oh yeah, do you guys remember how I said that Genesis ruined one of the most emotional moments of Surprise Future? Well, I was referring to the fact that the key moment of this film was that the day the film takes place, August 8th, was the one year anniversary of when Shinosuke and Krim met for the first time, with Krim giving Shinosuke access to the original drive pit as a gift. So when Genesis retcons Krim's first meeting with Shinosuke to actually occur back in 2005, it kind of leaves a sour note. Well, Genesis is non-canon though, except maybe not for Drive? So that does mitigate it a bit. While I do love how this film showcases the relationship between Shinosuke and Krim, it does lead to a bit of a miss in my opinion, which are the roles of Go and Chase in this film. I'm glad that they don't take up too much screen time in this film, since there was no reason to shove them in, but as a result, they feel forgotten about in this film. Overall, this was a great film, with some excellent drama, nice story pacing, and good characterization, but the lack of substantial character development and a lackluster villain means that it doesn't rank any higher. Yes, you could say this film didn't need to have a good villain, since it was more focused on the relationship between Kram and Shinosuke, but I still felt that even that aspect wasn't as strong as it could have been. Still though, an excellent film. Another summer film, and another film penned by Riku Sanjo. You all know what it is. Yeah, Double Forever is also simply amazing. While Shotaro was a huge badass in this film, even transforming into Joker and kicking ass solo, it's Philip who I felt was the best part about this film. His entire arc with believing Maria is his mother, and that hope to finally learn more about his past, went to a lot of great character moments and conflicts that really helped Philip grow as a person. Hell, this is the first time where Philip starts to judge the situation not through logic and facts, but through his own feelings, which is not only a stark contrast to how he was in the beginning, but makes for a nice reversal in this film, since Shotaro's the one who starts using logic to assess the situation at hand. And though I don't say much about the action, I really have to give credit to Koichi Sakamoto for making the fight scene simply amazing to watch, especially that final fight. It really feels like a grand finale with everything at stake. And the story itself was just as good as the characters in this film. The plot moved at a wonderful pace, with nothing feeling rushed or dragged on, and the twists and reveals were amazing, not feeling too obvious, but at the same time, there were enough clues for someone to piece the puzzle together on their own. Plus, I love the focus on Philip and Shotaro's relationship in this film, really testing the pair at one of their lowest points, but showing they'll still be there for each other no matter what. Now, there's one element I haven't talked about, and well, now that I've mentioned it, you're probably going to hate my opinion. I think the villains are pretty bad. Don't get me wrong, Katsumi is a really cool and badass character, but the dude is literally just like Gao with a fresh coat of paint. He does his job as a villain well, his plan was reasonable, but his characterization and motivation was just non-existent. Seriously, other than being batshit insane, what else did he really have to him that made him interesting as a character? I mean, we've had plenty of villains that were just insane before Katsumi. What does one more really add on? And as I've hinted in my section for Double Returns Eternal, his motivation didn't make sense to me. He wants to turn everyone into necro overs because he doesn't want to feel alone? Okay, but if that's true, why would you then kill your fellow necro over comrades? And I don't believe it's simply because of Gaia memory corruption, because the dude has never used the Gaia memory on himself before. Plus, he fully knows that there needs to be a serum to constantly keep on the necro overs alive, so by turning an entire city into necro overs, you are going to eventually run out of that serum to keep everyone alive. Why would you want to turn everyone into necro overs if you don't want to feel alone? without ensuring they would stay alive for more than a couple of days. And the rest of the Never crew are also just as bland as Katsumi. They all have one trait to finding them, and are just there to match four of Devil's Guy's memories. But there is one character I'm forgetting to mention, and I'm going to come in with another hot take. Maria S. Cranberry is Katsumi's mother, and I am 100% serious when I say that she is a better character and villain than Katsumi. We warned that our grief over losing a young Katsumi drove her to revive him as the neck were over and do anything to ensure her son remains happy, but after meeting Philip, she realizes that what she's done is wrong and goes against her own son, resulting in her death. Yeah, compare that to Katsumi who wanted to kill humans because he's insane. Sure, Katsumi may be the more memorable villain of the two, but just because you are more memorable doesn't mean you are better. Overall though, this was a fantastic movie, having a great focus on the relationship between Chitara and Philip and giving great development slash moments for Philip. The story was great, the action was also great, and the villains were serviceable. Well, instead of this film having the same writer as the previous film, it's the director that's the same for the previous film. And you can probably guess which one this is. Everyone's Space is here is honestly just as good as Double Forever, though there are a few things that made this movie place above it. While the characters didn't really go through much changes or developments, the entire story and drama is what made this film really stand out. 
From watching the Kamen Rider Club go through hijinks to prepare for space, the scene where Ford and Gintaro's friends switch on the Astro switches to help him in battle, the speech Gintaro makes, and many more scenes really make this one of the funnest movies to watch while also being one of the movies that really drag you into the stakes. What I'm trying to say is that this movie really makes you emotionally invested in everything, which is great because it just makes me care about the struggles everyone goes through in this film. And as I've hinted at before, like Double Forever, this film also combines great emotional beats with amazing action thanks to Koichi Sakamoto's direction. But now, we get to the three nitpicks I have with this film that prevent it from reaching any higher. First up is the character of Inga Blink. While she is a complete badass, I found her characterization could have had a bit more work, since all we really know about her is that she wants revenge against the villains for killing her father. Plus, the fact that she was really only there to exist as both Red Herring and Point was plot dump doesn't really make her any better. We also have the villains, as expected. The Tetsujin are honestly quite weak. They're sentient machines that want to enslave Earth because… they're evil? However, what makes them even worse is something that I covered way back when I talked about Ultimatum. That is, they took old heroes and deliberately turned them into villains just for the sake of advertising and fan service. What's worse is that one of the original villains from that series was reimagined as an ally for this film. Yeah, imagine if Kamen Rider in 20 years made a film where they just took the Go Rangers and rebooted them into the villain and made the Black Cross Fears modern incarnation an ally all for the sake of fan service. Would it be cool? Maybe. Would it be respectful? Not really. And the last point I want to make is actually focus on Gintaro. While I will always regard him as a great Kamen Rider character, he oddly acts really hypocritical in this film. To make it even worse, the dude believes he can befriend a weapon that at the time he believes has no sentience whatsoever and can change it, but then he believes that the Tetsujin, two clearly sentient machine beings, can't change and therefore must be destroyed. Like, why? I'm pretty sure the Tetsujin are the only villains that Gintaro has never attempted to befriend, forgive, or reason with. Hell, Gintaro even managed to convince Gamma to change, who was the mastermind behind everything. It's hypocritical for Gintaro to believe that XV2 can change, but neither of the Tetsujin. However, that is all just a nitpick, though it is because of those issues that it doesn't rank any higher. When comparing this film to Double Forever, while Double Forever has the better character arc that fits the overall narrative, story, and villain compared to this movie, I find this film had more emotional investment for me. Though honestly, those two films' rankings can swap depending on how I feel about it. They're both that good. Overall, just a really great film that has some flaws, but none that detract from the fun in a big way. We're at the last four, and this time, they're all ranked a 10 out of 10. Kinda. This one is like a 9.9 .9 out of 10, but I only use whole numbers, so it rounds up. Yeah, well, Mega Max is a very, very great film. There are some slight issues I have with it that cause it to be the lowest of the 10 out of 10 films. Don't get me wrong, I would absolutely recommend this film to everyone and say it is a near flawless film, but there are some things that prevent me from saying that it is a flawless film. With Oz's portion, I loved how it followed up on the ending of Oz, seeing Eiji and Ankh reunite and continuing both the story and character arcs each of them had in a meaningful way, namely Eiji being more motivated to restore Ankh as he knows that Ankh will be revived. However, while I did like Mikel in his arc, basically becoming a courageous hero, I kinda wish he wasn't in the film so we could instead solely focus on Eiji and Ankh, but since I like Mikel, it doesn't bug me as much. Next up is Forze's portion, and it was better than O's, since it gave some development to Gintaro by giving him a love interest. Now, I know giving someone a love interest to force their development is a very old trope, but I like the way it was handled here. Gintaro warned to be more honest with his feelings toward his friends, plus, seeing him with Nadashiko was kinda cute. Oh yeah, Nadashiko. She's also like Mikkel, but a bit better. She's an alien who turns out to be an SOLU. She's not human, and really only copies things she sees, but thanks to her interactions with Gintaro, she gained sentience. Overall, a really nice arc to pair with Gintaro's own. Plus, the story flowed fine, with a lot of fun moments and, like always, some really good emotional moments. Finally, we get to the team-up part, which is amazing. Not only do we get to see Gintaro and Eiji team up, but we also get to see Shotaro and Philip appear as well. Hell, we even get a reference to Double Forever in one of these interactions. Plus, I loved how Oz's and Forze's portion flowed together into the final part. It really felt like a finale that was built up, rather than being shoved in at the last minute. Speaking of returning actors, we do also see the return of the seven legendary writers, and in a way that shows them kicking serious ass, which is always a bonus in my eyes. However, here's why I call this the worst of the 10 out of 10 films. Which are the villains? Poseidon wants to kill Oz because he's evil. Lem Kanagi wants to take over the world's energy and rule over humanity because he's also evil. Yeah, no matter how good your story is, if your villains suck, you aren't gonna rate highly in my eyes. Overall, a near perfect movie. Oz's portion was a nice epilogue and continued the story of Oz by giving it a more happy ending, while Forze's portion gave good development to Gintaro. 
The villains, while weak, did their job, and I love seeing Shotaro, Philp, and the seven legendary riders again. Plus, the story and pacing, as I've said many times, was amazing. As I've hinted with Mega Max, these next three films are all films I would consider perfect. The only reason why I would rank one above the other is simply because I like one more than the other. The first of the perfect films is probably one that none of you guys were expecting. Drive Saga Chaser is an amazing movie that focuses on Chase in a brilliant way. It challenges him in a way that would naturally create strife in his character. His entire shtick was being socially awkward because he simply didn't understand human norms, nor could express emotions, so what better way to challenge him than by giving them the one thing he's wanted, the ability to express emotions. As a side note, to make sure none of you guys are confused by the things I say later down the line, the villain implants feathers into beings that will fill them with emotions at the cost of slowly sapping their free will away. Anyways, as the film progresses, he struggles to relinquish his newfound emotions since he fears people will come to dislike him for not being human anymore, but after realizing that his desire to be more human has endangered people, he decides to get rid of his emotions so he can protect the people he cares about. Honestly, his character arc gave him a development unmatched by any movie before it, and it really shows Chase in a good light. No matter what, he will always protect his friends, even if it means he must sacrifice a part of himself. Plus, the subplot of the film complemented Chase's arc extremely well. Hiroshi is a meek boy who initially distrusts Chase due to him not being human, which is the impetus for Chase wanting to gain emotions in the first place. Once Chase gains his emotion, the two of them bond really well, furthering Chase's desire to not give up his emotions since it's the first time he's able to help someone not as a common Rider, but as a human being. As their relationship deepens, Hiroshi reveals himself to be an introvert who hates not being able to open up to others, which is why when Hiroshi is given the chance to become more extroverted by gaining a feather, and the only way for Chase to save him is to rip out his own feather, Chase does so for reasons I explained earlier. While Hiroshi's own development was great to watch and mirror Chase's extremely well, the ending of the subplot also deserves praise, as it shows that just because Chase can't express himself as a human, that doesn't mean he can't help others and inspire them to change just by being himself. And finally, we have an amazing villain to drive the story. Angel is an over-evolved Roybu who, like I've stated earlier, can implant feathers into any being to fill them with emotions at the cost of slowly sapping their free will and turning them into puppets which Angel can control. While her characterization was decent, mainly just being a psychotic bitch in sheep's disguise, her motivation for her plan was actually great. She wants to control her roidmates not because she's evil, but because she genuinely believes that this will help everyone, as if everyone is content with their life, then no one will want to do anything, and thus, there will be no strife or conflict in the world. Her intentions were noble, it's just the methods she used to achieve it were not. Plus, the story itself was fantastic. While Chase and Hiroshi's arc bump up the narrative a lot, there were a lot of small scenes that really make this a great film to watch. From the small scenes we get between Chase, Brain, and Heart, a small expansion on Chase's backstory, as well as some fun comedy moments, there are simply a lot of other things that I didn't mention that really enhance the quality of this film. If there is a nitpick I can make about this film, it is mainly the scenes involving Ryu, as they were really just disconnected with the overall plot. But it's fine, as they were still enjoyable to watch. Overall, a really great movie with excellent development and expansion on Chase as a character, showing that while he may want emotions, he'll still choose to protect others. Angel as a villain was really well done. Her character and motivation weren't bland, which already puts her above most movie villains. The story fit well in the overall story of Drive, explaining what we never see or hear about this movie past episode 41, and I did like the more emotional parts in slower pace, since that's what the movie was going for. Our runner-up for the best Kamen Rider film is the conclusion to the greatest trilogy of Kamen Rider films, Gem vs. Laser. This might be the X8 fanboy inside of me, but I really fucking love this movie. It is one of the only times where I actually started tearing up, which is not an easy feat. Hell, the only other scene that has made me tear up before was the letter speech from Forze's finale. Now, the story itself was amazing. While it was certainly fast paced, that's mainly attributed to being the finale of the Another Ending trilogy. And this did certainly feel like a finale to a trilogy. Everything in the past two films were building up culminated in a fantastic story and film. There's really not much else I can say about the story other than it is amazing and definitely requires watching both Brave and Snipe and Paradox with Poppy to get the full experience. Kiryu himself was good, but I feel like he was more there as a mirror to Kuroto in his arc. And the other characters, while not really doing much, I still feel like had a nice payoff to their own arcs, especially Saiko and Masamune. But now, we get to the character who single-handedly made this movie rank so high, Kuroto Dan. Now, to be clear, while Kuroto isn't one of my favorite characters in Rider, this film makes him place pretty high up for simply how much this film goes in unraveling the complexity of his character. 
Now, this is a lot of interpretation on my part, but to me, this just makes his character a lot more complex, tragic, and sympathetic. His goal is to essentially put the entire world through a game known as Zombie Chronicle, forcing the players to fight against zombie gamers, though if they manage to defeat one, a victim of the bug survivors will come back. At the end of the film, it's hinted that Kuroto only enacted this plan as a test for humanity, mainly to see if his way is truly correct. If he is unable to be beaten, then it shows that humanity cannot overcome him, and thus his intellect and knowledge is still required. However, if he can be beaten, then the safety of humanity's future will be ensured and he will no longer be needed for his intellect. Kuruto truly does want to save humanity, but his distrust in the world and their abilities make him test them first to see if they're truly capable of achieving his goal, since his distrust stems from the hospital and by extension the world's inability to save his mother. But thanks to Kiryu defeating him, Kuruto realizes that he can entrust the lives of everyone to Kiryu and the others and passes on, even giving Kiryu the key to reviving Bugsters as humans in the form of the God Maximum Mighty X get shot. Honestly, Kuruto is just such a great character in this film, and his arc is something that really carries this movie hard. There's really not much else I can say about this film other than you should watch it solely for Kuroto. Sure, you may be wondering why despite praising a lot fewer aspects of the film compared to Drive Saga Chaser, this movie still ranks higher, but that's simply because I found Kuroto a much better of a character and villain compared to Angel, and the film had more memorable moments for me. By process of elimination, you already know what number one is going to be, so I'm not going to keep you waiting. Yes, this might be the cliché choice for Best Writer Film, but it's well-deserved. Paradise Lost is an exceptional film that simply does everything right. The characters are amazing and given great expansion, the story is tight with no scenes feeling dragged on or rushed, the villain is amazing and probably the best movie villain to date, and the action is stunning, with probably some of the most striking scenes in a film to date. Starting off with the action, I think this film has some of the best action in a writer film to date. From the fight between Kaisa and Saiga, to Fize and Saiga, and the final showdown between Takumi and Kiba, there are just so many great scenes that have stuck with me, and the final writer kick of the film is simply the best finale finisher to a film to date. To add on, none of the fights really felt forced, with each one having a queer purpose. The story is great. Even though this is an alternate universe, I feel like this film really fleshes out this universe extremely well. The world building is fantastic, and the alternate universe scenario really does feel like it impacts the story, compared to films such as Kabuto, Blade, or Ryuki, where the alternate universe scenario barely has an impact. Plus, like I've mentioned before, there aren't really any pacing issues I have with this movie. The beginning of the film does an excellent job introducing the viewer to this new universe, and the pacing changes with respect to the story. It goes fast when it needs to go fast, and it goes slow when it needs to go slow. And the characters, good god were they great. While Takumi, Mari, Kusaka, and Keitaro didn't really develop much, they still all got their moments to shine, and they acted pretty much like they did in the TV series, which is great. From Takumi accepting himself as the savior of this world, to Keitaro getting the courage to stand up for himself, or Leo just being… the best. Each of these characters felt like they were written to be at their best, and then went beyond that. Hell, even the new characters felt like well-established characters. I've already mentioned Weo, who, uh, is great for reasons you already know. Mizuhara was a great secondary antagonist, being hot-headed and reckless who hates all Orphanox, which actually leads to his own avoidable death. Mina is really the only exception to this rule, since she was really just there to have a point with Love Triangle because… in new way. But at least she doesn't take up too much screen time. Though now, we get to THE greatest character to ever exist in a Kamen Rider film, Yuji Kiba. Yeah, what they did to him was brutal, but my god, he still remains one of my most beloved characters. While Kaido and Yuka were alright, they were nothing compared to what Kiba got in this film. He still retains his dream that Orphanox and humans can coexist, but after betrayal after betrayal, his conviction finally cracks, resulting in probably one of the saddest scenes in Kamen Rider. Just watching him lament and scream out over wondering what he's been fighting for all this time after watching both of his friends die and believing that Mari's betrayed him simply because she doesn't believe Orphanox can exist with humans is just heartbreaking. But it's because of this that he fully accepts being an Orphanox and becomes Orca, dueling with Takumi in one of the most epic fight scenes. However, after discovering that Takumi, despite being an Orphanox, fights for humanity and coming to the realization that the Mari who betrayed him was a fake, he sacrifices himself, telling Takumi and Mari to carry on his dream to create a world where everyone can coexist. Honestly, I could go on and on about this film for how great it is, but hopefully, you can see why I find this film to be the best writer film to date. An amazing story that has excellent pacing and filled to the brim with drama, the action has that standing, the characters felt well utilized and had small developments, the new characters felt well fleshed out, and Kiba comes out as my favorite Kamen Rider movie villain and character to exist. Well, this has certainly been a long road, but thank you all for watching this 4-part series. I'm Kamisa to RX, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Till next time.